Alrighty, let's get started. We've got another full day of wonderfulness. Our first speaker is Joe Schwartz. Uh, he's the director of McGill University's Office for Science and Society. He's got two incredible books for sale, uh, Science, Sense, and Nonsense, and Brain Fuel. His talk is called The Worms in My Blood Vessels. Nice. Here's his haiku. Sunday morning Tam. Joe Schwartz, ready to talk next. It is Sunday, right? Please welcome Joe Schwartz. Thanks very much. It was a dark and stormy night. It really was. And there was a knock on my door. And standing there was a salesman. He looked kind of haggard. He wanted in. I didn't know what it was all about. So I ushered him into my kitchen. And we sit down and he looks over at my water tap. And he says to me, sir, is this what you drink? And I sheepishly admitted, yes, this is what we drink. We even give it to the dog with no problem. <laughs> And at this point, he started to look confused. And he says, sir, tell me, do you know that there are chemicals in that water? Well, I didn't know where this was going. I thought it was a little bit too early to say, boy, did you knock on the wrong door? Because uh, I kind of felt something delicious coming out of this. So I said, what do you mean? Do you mean the H2O? And he says, no, 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 that's not what I mean. I mean the hidden chemicals in your water. Can I see those? By all means, he says, let's take a glass of your water. We do that. And then he reaches into his bag and he pulls out this contraption, a couple of electrodes, and plunks them down into the water, turns on the current, and within a couple of seconds, it starts to go yellow. And it goes all cruddy. And he holds it up for me to see. This is what I was drinking. Apparently, the chemicals had been dissolved happily in the water, but now they were scared out of solution by the electrical current that cruised through them. Of course, I knew what was happening here. This was just ferric hydroxide. Basically, it was rust. That's what we were looking at. But I still didn't know quite where this was going, so I kind of let him go on. And then he reaches into his bag again and drags out a water filter. He passes my water through the water filter. We have another glass of water. He puts in his electrodes, and lo and behold, nothing happens. Well, this was getting pretty good. I realized what was going on here. Of course, water does not conduct electricity unless it has electrolytes in it. And the filter indeed removed the electrolytes, so it was a pretty good, good filter. And uh, then I decided it was time for a chemistry lesson because, of course, the message was that, that you know, now I was liberated from all of these nasty chemicals. So I said, let me just take a bit of salt and put it in the water and now shove your electrodes back in, which, of course, he did. And the same crud happened. He was all confused. He couldn't understand how that tiny amount of salt made all of these terrible chemicals appear. Now it was time for lesson number two. So I picked up the glass of water and I drank it. Because I knew that at the very least I was giving myself a little iron supplement. And at that point his face turned about the color of that liquid. And he was just absolutely confused. And then I tried. I said, you know what we've just experienced here was electrolysis. It's a very simple chemical experiment. Maybe you did it one time in, in high school where you had this contraption and you put electric current through it and the water separated into hydrogen and oxygen. And indeed, if one of those electrodes happens to be iron, the oxygen reacts with it and you get iron hydroxide. I'm not sure how much of this he understood. But then I confused him further because I bought one of his filters. <laughs> I'd been looking for one to take the chlorine out of the water anyway. And then I watched as this gentleman walked out of my house, into the driveway, put his briefcase in the trunk of his car, leaned back, confused, and lit up a smoke. <laughs> he, totally, totally oblivious of all of the nasty chemicals in there. Well, of course, it's, it's an interesting story, but it has sort of a, a, a further message because this contraption that you're looking at here, which I'm sure many of you have seen, the ionic foot bath, which draws toxins out of the body. You put your feet in there, you 
put it into the uh, electrical outlet and within about 30 seconds you see the toxins appear. It's exactly the same chemistry that I just described to you. But six, seven hundred dollars is what uh, unfortunate people pay for this, uh, this contraption just because they don't understand the chemistry that is involved. Well, this is what we try to clear up through our office at, at McGill University in Montreal. It's a, an academic institution, and it's one of the, I think, uh, few such uh, organizations in the world where university has said that it, our duty basically to foster critical thinking and provide good information. Uh, I do this with my colleagues David Harp and Ariel Fenster, and uh, we've been at this for many, many years. We don't have any vested interest. Uh, which is the reason that I think we are trusted and, and believed. Uh, we're funded by the university and also uh, thanks to a generous philanthropic grant, grant from Dr. Laurent Trottier. He is not the one in the red shirt uh, in, in the picture. Uh, Laurent is, uh, is there and uh, he has made it possible for us to, to operate on a grander scale, uh, including uh, uh, a very, very important symposium that we run every year. Uh, this particular one was on confronting pseudoscience, and uh, at that one, the amazing one actually appeared and amazed the audience of some 700 uh, people. Uh, we do this every year, uh, just uh, to tickle your fancy. The next one is coming up this October. Uh, we've entitled, Is That a Fact? And uh, we are going to have some pretty nifty uh, speakers there. So that's, that's what we do. We demystify science, we try to keep people up to date on what happens in the world of science, foster critical thinking, separate science from nonsense, and hopefully keep people out of the clutches of charlatans. When we first started this, I thought we needed a logo, and I suggested this to the university. <laughs> it's not that we're against eating meat, no, what we're against is this commodity, uh, which is being piled higher and deeper. University didn't go for it. But I, I think it, it does describe what it is that we do because there's so much nonsense out there. People are buying aerobic oxygen and if they can't get their hands on that, they want dehydrated water. <laughs> which of course you need to make up your homeopathic solutions. Uh, there's tremendous nonsense. An ad that was dropped in my bail mailbox for underwear. Pretty good underwear, pro polypropylene, it allows moisture to pass through. But just look at the words. H2O, also known as sweat, is attracted to thermoskins skins like ants to a picnic. Our constant comfort process separates the H2 from the O, making evaporation take faster. Well, we'll leave the graphic artist alone who thinks that there's a covalent bond between the hydrogens in, in water. Uh, but imagine, I mean, this would be miraculous underwear because it could perform electrolysis. Uh, if all you had to do was rub your underwear to produce hydrogen, well, you know what hydrogen can do, you remember the Hindenburg? <laughs> we'd, we'd have a solution to the energy crisis. The quacks are out there. We try to reason with them, uh, but we can't turn them over uh, as much as we would like because they're everywhere. They're massive, they're outside our homes, they're inside our homes, and many of them are vicious. <laughs> if you've ever had confrontations with the anti-vaccine people, you know what I'm talking about. So we battle all of these things. We don't yield because we have ammunition. Our ammunition is evidence. It is the scientific literature. That is the altar at which we worship, sometimes I think perhaps a bit too much, because after all, Andrew Wakefield appeared in The Lancet. I've been in this for a long time. Way back in 1980, I was asked to do a radio show. Uh, it is uh, kind of disturbing that it was that long ago, as is obvious here. Uh, of course, it's only obvious because you see the dial telephone in the picture. <laughs> You know, I don't remember the first question that I was asked, but I remember the second question because it's stymied me. I thought I heard this rather incredible query. <laughs> I didn't know what to make of that, and all of a sudden you start to have these strange anatomical juxtapositions go through your mind. Uh, but it turned out that the caller had spoken very quickly and had forgotten a word which was golf. Because it seems that golfers sometimes have the habit of putting down their golf ball, picking it up, kissing it before whacking it again. 
for superstitious reasons. And this gentleman was concerned about chemicals on the golf course. He was worried that he might be transferring some of these to his, uh, his mouth. So we discussed this. And right away I saw that when people think that they're talking to a chemistry professor, these are the questions that arise. Is it toxic? Is it dangerous? Is it poisonous? I get these all the time. Is tripolyphosphate a chemical? What they're asking, is it really dangerous? That's what they want to know. Because chemists do bad things. We unleash carcinogens on the unsuspecting population to try to kill off as many as possible. That's what we try to do. Well, I uh, get a, a, a call from uh, this lady who was worried about the phosphate, and she had seen it on a cleaning agent. She wanted to know what it was doing in there. So I explained that everything in the world, of course, is made of chemicals, and, and you know, I, I guess she kind of uh, uh, understood that, and I said that this just made the detergents work better by tying up the minerals in the water. She was pacified. She calls me back two weeks later. I recognized her voice, even though there was panic in it. And this time she had again crossed swords with sodium tripolyphosphate, this time on a different product. It was on Kraft Dinner. So she says to me, you know, I give my son Kraft Dinner every day, which apparently was not a problem. <laughs> what is a cleaning agent doing in there? So I explained, no, here it's performing quite a different purpose. It allows water to be absorbed more quickly by the starch in the macaroni so that you can feed your clamoring child uh, the dinner that he wants every day more rapidly. I don't think she bought it because chemicals are okay in cleaning agents, you don't want them in your food. She probably had some perverse idea that the craft company, of course being an evil company as all multinationals are, uh, had discovered that eating their product is a messy business and wanted to clean the kit from the inside out. <laughs> and they had found some magical way. Where do they get such ideas? By reading books like this. A Dictionary of Food Additives by Ruth Winter. I don't think she should be writing books like this uh, because, well, let me show you why. Trisodium phosphate, if my phosphate feeding friend looked up here, would see phosphate, and cleaning agent, bubble bath, all of that makes sense, but also in incendiary bombs and tracer bullets. Now she would not only worry about her son being cleaned from the inside out, she'd worry about him bursting into flame and disappearing, but not without a trace. <laughs> Ruth Winter makes the most fundamental of all chemical errors, confusing phosphorus with phosphate. Phosphorus is the element, highly flammable. Phosphate, completely different substance. Well, of course, people buy these books, and that's where chemophobia starts. And that's one of our main battles, is to try to take away the fear of chemicals in a rational way, because, of course, there are some issues. There are no safe or dangerous chemicals. There are only safe ways and dangerous ways to use them. We investigate. And we get products sent to us, too, to investigate. For example, this one here, which is supposed to make you smarter. You wear it over your eyes. Uh, it looks pretty nifty. It's got all kinds of uh, gadgets associated with it. I don't think it made me smarter because uh, uh, I went further and tested another product that they sent me which was this device which uh, allows you to levitate a ball by concentrating on it. Well, it actually does, as long as you turn on the fan, which is in the base of the... Uh... <laughs> so we investigate, uh, we look at products such as this, which claims to magnetize water. Uh, well, water, of course, cannot be magnetized, but uh, the idea here is that this will cure everything that ails you if you drink the magnetized uh, water. It makes you want to scream. But uh, let me get to a point where really it, it starts to, to become even more interesting for you guys, so the skeptics. Uh, this gentleman here, Zev Coleman, is a healer in New York. But he goes around the world healing people, and he came to Montreal. And uh, I was actually asked to meet with him because he wanted to reveal the word to me. So we did. And I met him and he told me his story, how he had been a, a soldier in Israel and one day while he was stationed in the Sinai Desert, that, that was about 35 years ago, uh, he all of a sudden was called to the top of the mountain. He didn't understand but he had to go up there. And when he went up there, he saw this strange gray disc hovering above the mountain and he just passed out. 
And when he came down from the mountain, and of course this image immediately comes to your mind, uh, he felt energized. He felt energized. He had discovered that all of a sudden he had a healing ability because he had placed his hand on his friend's knee who had been complaining of arthritic pain and all of a sudden that pain departed. So he discovered that he had this magical ability to heal people and uh, including Martin Sheen. I'm not sure how much of a testimonial that is, uh, you know, how effective uh, he was there. He goes around the world and of course there are the usual anecdotes about his wonderful healing uh, abilities, how he can generate electricity from his hands and how people, subjects, actually feel this electricity. I sent my assistant to see him and she comes back, she's very reliable, and she says to me, you know, I felt it. I was lying there, he hovered his hand above my uh, body and I felt it like when you put your hand in front of a television set. So I didn't know what this was all about. So when you have a problem like this, who are you going to call? <laughs> so I called and uh, Randy uh, kind of knew all about this. And he says, maybe you guys better check out a device called Electric Touch. Now, I didn't know about that particular device, but I know quite a bit about magic because I've been doing that since I was about 10 years old. So I went down to my uh, magic shop and uh, I got them. They didn't have it in stock, but I had it delivered by next day, Electric Touch. It's a neat little gizmo. Uh, what you do is, it's about the size of a pack of cards, and you wrap it around your leg and uh, it allows, with a, because it has a high voltage that infuses into you, you can do all kinds of fascinating things. You can pick up little pieces of paper and you can raise the hairs on, on people. You know, I mean, it's really very, very impressive. Now, I don't know for sure that this is what he was doing, but I suspect that you know, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it pretty well is one. But anyway, I was, you know, pretty, pretty uh, uh, polite to him. And I said, look, you know, we'd right, really like to test this. And uh, could you come down to my office at McGill and we'll set up a proper test? And he said, very, very happy. Yes, he, he would do that. But because I knew how this thing worked, and I, I think this was a mistake, I said, but, you know, uh, the way that we're going to do this test is we'll ask you to do it barefoot. Now, this, of course, unfortunately gave away that I knew what the, the uh, game was. And that's the last I heard of him. But he had planned to come back to Montreal a month later because he had lined up all kinds of appointments and he was charging $100 for a 15 minute, quote, treatment. Well, he never came back to Montreal. So that was somewhat of a, <laughs> a victory. <laughs> but he is everywhere, he is traveling, and he even can do his magic from the air. As you can see, on the trip to Israel, he was ad advertising that he would be having a healing session from the air and you could sign up for this. Well, I wrote about this uh, in my newspaper column and that invites all kinds of other interesting people. So I got an email from a lady, this was quite recent, uh, who told me that she was authentic. She had real power, she didn't know how, but she was willing to be tested. So I talked to her at quite some length and I said, what, you know, what is this all about? What is it that you can do? And she says, I can see inside the body. Says, for example, if someone has chlorine in them, I see this as yellow bubbles. If someone has radon inside of them, I see this as blue bubbles. And said, well, what else can you see? Says, I can see germs and I can prove it to you. So I was thinking, you know, well, how can we come up with a test, you know, that is somewhat reliable, that she can demonstrate her abilities? And I said, well, can you also see these, these germs in, in water? And she says, oh, absolutely. I can see it in living water. She says, what is living water? She says, living water is lake water, river water. And I said, what is non-living water? She says, oh, that's the stuff that comes out of your tap or that's in bottles, that's dead water. She said, you can tell the difference? She says, yes, I can look at it, I can tell you the difference. So I said, well, we got something here. So we set up a test. We had tap water, bottled water, lake water. I didn't know which was which. Nobody knew which was which. It was all done by a third person. And I said, look, we're going to randomly put one of those waters into each one of 15 glasses. We're going to throw a die for each one and 
someone else who was totally objective is going to put the water in, into those. And I said, look, it's going to be a quick test just to see if you can have, if you have some ability, and if you do, we'll go further. And I said, look, uh, I looked into the statistics a little bit, said, look, if you get uh, 10 out of 15 right, that makes it interesting. That means that we should proceed further to see if there's anything here. So she comes and we do the test, and she gets 8 out of 15 right. I must say I was a little bit surprised. It was a bit more than what uh, one would have predicted, but it was short of the 10. Uh, of course, she starts coming up you know, with the usual reasons that you know, the, the skepticism aura in the room was interfering or whatever. And uh, you know, just as I was about to, to kind of explain to her that I really thought this was quackery, um, she came up with another line of reasoning. She says, well, yeah, but you know, this is not what I really do. What I really do is scan people for, for disease. I can look at them and I know what's going on inside of their body. So I said, you know, what, what is it that you do? Is it like a CAT scan? And um, <laughs> no, she says, it's, it's totally non-invasive. I, I can just look at you and tell you what's going on inside. So I said, okay, let's give that a shot. We'll give it a shot with me, my, my colleague and uh, assistant. Let's see what you've got. So I, I sit down and she starts scanning me, not touching or anything. She closes her eyes and she starts looking me up and down. And the first thing she says to me, you're full of carbon. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, you got that right. But then she says, well, that's because in previous years you were a smoker. Well, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life, ever. Then she goes on and says, well, I also see that you have lead in your lungs. And we usually see this in welders. Well, I think I've soldered one wire once in my life. That's the closest I came to, to any kind of such a, a, a activity. And then she goes on. She says, I see worms in your blood vessels. And then she goes on and describes these worms. And it kind of sounded like schistosomiasis, which is a real disease. People really do get those worms, but not in North America. I've not been in Africa. I don't think I have this. Uh, but she says that I have worms. And then she's looking further down. She says, your red blood cells are too big kind of hard to verify that. And then she looks even further down, starts looking at an uncomfortable spot, and she says, uh, your prostate gland. Well, you know, now I'm getting kind of, you know, anxious here because, you know, you reach an age where stuff happens to your prostate gland. She says, your prostate gland is growing mushrooms. <laughs> well, this time, you know, I'm thinking to myself, boy, Maybe you've been into the mushrooms. <laughs> uh, so I don't know what on earth she meant. Maybe she meant some sort of fungal infection or, or whatever. I mean, I don't think I have mushrooms uh, going there. But I, I was a bit better off than my colleague, Ariel, because uh, she told him that uh, he had a tumor in his left testicle. Now, that's not funny. I mean, he doesn't. But to say something like that you know, to a person is, is not funny. I mean, we had a hard time kind of keeping a straight face with, with all of this, but, but she was very, very serious. And then she said that she can do something else. She can communicate with the spirit world. Now, this was getting really, really interesting. And so I said, well, what evidence do you have for that? So she says, you know, I know that you are always losing your keys. Well, actually, I don't. I, I don't remember ever having lost my keys. And, uh, but I was still keeping a straight face. Say, and why? What, what's the reason? He says, I know. It's a mischievous spirit of a former girlfriend that you left for your wife, and she is hiding your keys all the time. Well, at this point, uh, I, you know, I started to explain uh, why I didn't think that this was really very, very rational, and started to explain to her about cold reading, which I, you know, she, she, she was into. And she, after this time, had been very polite. We'd given her a nice lunch and everything. And then all of a sudden, of course, she comes up with all the reasons why this, this didn't work. And she got off 
uh, huffed and puffed and, and walked out. That's how this episode ended. But interesting enough, you know, these episodes breed other episodes. I get a letter from a gentleman who had uh, read about you know, my encounter, or I actually I talked about it on radio, and he said that, yes, there are a lot of charlatans out there, but he's the real thing. Max the healer. So uh, Max turned out to be a very nice guy, and we invited him down to the office and asked him, you know, what is it that, that you can do? And I know, uh, you know, when I told this at home, you know, they said, well, you know, you, anyone who, who invites this guy down to the office maybe should have his head examined. But I did. I had my head examined by Max the Healer because he said that I would feel the energy. I would feel it wherever there was any problem in the body. It would get warm. Uh, of course, I didn't feel anything. Uh, but that's, you know, N equal 1. We went on and my, uh, my colleague tried it as well. He didn't feel any sort of energy uh, either. But this was a pretty clever guy, interestingly enough, because as we were doing this, this experiment, uh, uh, one of my assistants came in and she started to take a coffee and uh, we, got, we had a machine brewing the coffee and uh, took one of the cups off, off the shelf. It happened to be a very interesting cup because it's a cup that, that's uh, made with liquid crystals and it gets hot. Uh, when it gets hot, the color changes. She didn't know that. She just picked up a cup random. She puts it under the coffee machine and uh, of course, as soon as the hot liquid starts to go into it, the cup starts to change color. And she was very surprised and says, look, what's going on? And he right away looks up and says, I think I did that. <laughs> but then he learned something about liquid crystals and he took it uh, pretty good uh, uh, naturedly. So, of course, the question is, what do we do with all of this information? I mean, it's nice to entertain fellow uh, skeptics and fellow critical thinkers, but what is it that we do? How do we get the disbelievers to start to believe in our type of thought? Well, I write uh, newspaper columns uh, uh, every week, and uh, they have a large following, and I, I very often focus on this kind of stuff. Of course, not ex exclusively. I focus on all kinds of, of, of science stuff. And uh, these columns uh, appear in my 13 books, along with many, many other uh, ideas, of course. And uh, most of them have been uh, bestsellers. Uh, the last one just came out, it's called The Right Chemistry, which, has, which I think is one of the best ones, but the sales have not been great because the word chemistry in the title uh, is, is not very seductive to most people, unfortunately. And I thought that you know, after having been in this business 35, 40 years, maybe I could have uh, altered that. I uh, do a lot of TV stuff, uh, very often focusing on separating the myths from the facts. And, uh, you know, some of it is local, but uh, some of it is, is national. I, uh, a couple of months ago, I was on Dateline, and this was all about bisphenol A and phthalates, all the endocrine disruptors. And they interviewed me for three hours, three hours, translated to 58 seconds uh, on the program, which, is, as you well know, is par for the course. Is the, is, is the, you know, the man bites dog is what gets the, the, the story. The dog bites man, it uh, doesn't. And even though, uh, you know, I, I gave thorough explanations of all of this stuff, that they, they hammered it down to, to 58 seconds. Uh, we also give lectures to, to, to public lectures to all kinds of groups, uh, senior citizens. Uh, they're very interested, of course, usually in the alternative health business. And the other extreme, of course, we speak to students. Uh, because if you get them interested, well, you know that, that curiosity is to science what a spark is to a flame. And if we can generate curiosity, we can get them to be skeptical uh, thinkers. We also have a set of courses at McGill University called the World of Chemistry, which we teach to about a thousand students every year on drugs, on food, cosmetics, and the environment. And uh, we are going to launch a new venture with these courses very soon. Uh, the so-called MOOCs, the massive online uh, courses. So that's, that's uh, been very fruitful. We also have a website, of course, and uh, everyone uh, should these days because that's the major way of communicating. I've been asked to testify in front of uh, uh, Senate in, in Canada about chemical issues, and very often I launch into the critical thinking business. I've also done it in, in the U.S. 
uh, it was a bit more difficult uh, uh, here, I, I must say. Although, uh, when I was asked to speak to the congressmen, two of them were actually chemists. And they were glad they told me that they can finally come out of the closet uh, and admit <laughs> that they, they are chemists. So anyway, it's a difficult job. And uh, I'll leave you with one last little story here. Is one day on the radio, I was talking about vitamin O and be reading this product as it deserves to be because it's total quackery, it's nothing but water. And I went on for about five minutes talking about this stuff and how important it was to be a critical thinker and you know, I explained the chemistry and all of that. And then we go to the lines because it's a, it's a phone-in show. I mean, I've been doing this show now, as I said, for 30 years. It's the longest running phone-in show on chemistry in the history of the world. <laughs> Of course, it is the only chemistry <laughs> film in the show in history of the world. You see, we, we are adept at cherry-picking data, too. So anyway, what happens? I finish my, my arguments, my venomous attack about vitamin O. I go to the phones. The first caller says, where can I buy it? <laughs> you can't win. I don't have an answer because we scientists do not have an answer to everything. There are some questions to which there just are no answers. Uh, but we, we, mustn't, we mustn't give up, we must search for them, and we've got to be out there and fostering the critical thinking. And uh, hopefully I've given you a couple of ideas that maybe you can use when you meet some of your colleagues who need to be skepticized. Thank you. Joe Schwartz, Joe Schwartz, come on, that's the way you do it. Excellent.